Looks like we're live. Hello and good morning and uh, welcome to our show. Um, good morning, Revolution. Hey, Scott, how are you? What's up? Doing well, how are you? It's snowy here. I've got about uh, four and a half inches in the last three hours, I'd say. so. Oh, congratulations. It's been raining cats and dogs here and ain't nothing mm -hmm. I hate worse than cold rain. I'd rather yeah. have it snow. Oh, me too, yeah. Of course, I come from snow country back in Youngstown, Ohio, um, but uh, New York is milder and warmer, and so we don't get as much snow. And then you add global warming to it, and uh, I don't think we've had one snowfall so far this year, at least that I we can remember. Had, we haven't had much. It's been a really unseasonably warm uh, winter for us uh, here in but upstate New York. But it's hot in D.C. <laughs> Temperatures rising. Uh, yeah. Just uh, before we before we jump in here, uh, I just got an email from uh, John Bactel, who's supposed to join us. He says he's in, but um, uh, needs to be promoted to a panelist so that he can talk. Okay. Um, if I can anyway, do. As I was saying, it is hot in D.C., and uh, we had the impeachment, and um, Trump was exonerated. And we're just joined by my good friend and comrade, John Bactel. Hey, John, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Good to see you. I'm OK. We were just talking about the uh, acquittal in the Senate uh, by the Republicans. They acquitted Mr. Trump, with the exception of Mr. Romney, who, for the first time in the history of the uh, Senate trials of a president, joined uh, with uh, an opposition party and voted to convict. And just, and, oh, just jumping in real quick there, I think, uh, you know, the Senate voted to acquit him. Um, I don't think that represents in any way an exoneration, even in fact, for many Republicans who, uh, you know, are now all admitting, oh yes, it, well, what he did was completely wrong, but it doesn't, whatever. So I don't think that, I would, I would, I would not use the word exoneration for, he claims it. But. Well, you know, that's an interesting question. I mean, isn't that a kind of a class and democratic question as well? I mean, from the standpoint of the ruling class, or at least certain sections of it, you know, they think that you know, from their point of view, no matter what he did, since he's pursuing their class interests, yeah, you know, it's okay. What do you think, John? Well, I mean, it's pretty clear based on the uh, <laughs> evidence that was presented that the guy was guilty of extortion and bribery and then cover up. And he said he didn't do that, nothing wrong. It was a perfect <laughs> call. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's going to say that and. I, I don't know if you had a chance to watch his uh, press conference yesterday or his acquittal party at the White House, but it was really the most uh, unbelievable display of hubris. And uh, he's he's now he's as as any autocrat would he's entering into a whole period now of payback. And so I think we're going to see that, and it's going to be a, a really ugly period uh, going forward uh, from his from his vantage point. And also, um, you know, these investigations are going to continue. The House investigation is going to continue. But now you're going to have a sham investigation being conducted in the Senate. I see that they're going after uh, Biden's son They're going after Biden's son. But Scott, let me ask you, do you think Trump is stronger now or weaker after the Senate trial and acquittal? Oh, I, it's an excellent question. I think probably stronger, um, or mm -hmm. at least, at least that there's a, there's a section of the anti-Trump forces that uh, risk being demoralized and demobilized by this acquittal who, who had, you know, held out their hopes that this was going to be the thing that broke, uh, and, and, you know, acquittal was from the beginning almost a foregone conclusion. Um, but about the, the press conference yesterday, the, the, the uh, acquittal party, as, as John aptly called it, what struck me was his claim that, you know, this has been so hard on his family. It's just been a, a re they've gone through hell for this. And it underscored um, that a lot of the loyalty that he's trying to create and a lot of the loyalty that's felt toward him is personal rather 
than ideological necessarily. People identify with him and he encourages people to identify with him on a personal level, which is, strikes me as the culmination of kind of a, a process that's been happening in, in our political life, the, the, the personalization of, of politics based, you know, this idea that um, it's about an identification between a voter and a, a candidate on a personal level, which strikes me as somewhat individualistic and bourgeois. Well, you know, I think we kind of live in a bifurcated world, you know, and I mean, maybe from the ruling class point of view, they might think he's stronger. Uh, they might think that he was acquitted, but I think from our point of view, from the standpoint of the people, he's weaker. There has never been a mass movement against a sitting president on the scale of what happened in this country uh, on January, I mean, sorry, November 7th or 8th, whatever the day was that the election took place, when people took to the streets shouting, not my president. And that has continued up until today. And particularly if you look at what happened in the midterms two, uh, a year and a half ago, man, they got their butts whooped. So it's, it's uh, and this is shaping the primaries and uh, everything else. Speaking of which, John, you were out there in Iowa uh, covering the event uh, for the people's world. What in the Sam hell has been going on out there? I mean, how come they can't figure out who won? Or maybe, or do you think you know who won? Uh, well, that's, that's uh, uh, I think it's clear now that, that Sanders, Bernie Sanders came out with the uh, uh, larger vote uh, total. Um, okay. And just by a few thousand votes. Uh, Yay, never Bernie. Was, he okay. did win. And, but the way they they have a very arcane way of figuring out delegates. So in the end, uh, this, at least the state delegate count, uh, Buttigieg, you know, would come out ahead, which is crazy when you think about it. Because of you know, if you if you get more votes, you figure you're going to get more delegates. So it's but in the like end, the electoral college, huh? Yeah, somewhat. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the end, I think they'll probably end up with the same number of national national or delegates to the national convention uh, and number. then uh, yeah and then oh, yeah. followed by elizabeth warren um but uh anyway it's it's a it's a big mess and i think the uh it's going to put an end really to it could put an end to the iowa caucus uh it'll be the final nail in the uh coffin of the of the iowa caucus and for sure mm -hmm. its position as uh, the first event in the primary season. I think it's been so much, there's been so much criticism of that caucus, uh, just its unrepresentative character in terms mm -hmm. of the rest of the country demographically. Um, but also uh, it's, it, it has had, you know, problems with, uh, it's just democratic character uh, for a long time now. So I think this will probably be the end of it. And isn't it the case that, that these caucuses are, are held at specific times and, and places and people who can't attend them simply can't attend, like if they can't get childcare, if they have to work, whatever, they, they just can't make it and they're, so yeah, it doesn't, it seems like there's, there's definitely a better way of going about it. Yeah, yeah, and I think that, you know, per, uh, Tom Perez, you know, the, the uh, chair of the DNC, you know, he had been urging, uh, these caucuses in various states to convert to primaries, to voting primaries. And actually that's what happened in Washington state and a couple of other states they converted uh, for this year. Uh, but Iowa resisted and I think the, there's also Nevada. Um, but uh, it's not, yeah, it's not as democratic. And, you know, people have to commit a whole evening of their time, um, you know, to to go and oftentimes people are working. One of the uh, reforms that was made um, actually at the behest of the Sanders campaign was they set up what they call satellite caucuses. Yeah. And so for example, you have shift workers and there were a whole uh, satellite caucus of, I think they were either meat packers or, or something like that uh, who, who uh, gathered together. And there was also a satellite caucus made up just of Spanish speaking people. 
this was really an extension of the democracy and allowed more people to participate. But it really still doesn't, uh, I think it's undemocratic in the sense that people just, many people just cannot commit the kind of time that's required uh, to participate. What was the mood like out there in, in Iowa? John, did you get a sense of momentum, of movement, of excitement? What was what was going on? Oh, yeah, there's a tremendous amount of excitement and uh, in the base of Democratic voters in particular. Um, you know, one of the things I was, well, I was struck by a couple of things. One is, you know, how, how, how thoughtful people are in terms of mulling over these candidates. And um, you know, a third of the people who attended the caucuses didn't make their decision about who they were supporting until the very last minute. And in fact, that's one of the factors people are saying may have contributed to not having as many people participate as they thought. They, they, were, they were anticipating a record turnout based right. on the enthusiasm yeah. and right. the movement and so on. Uh, it didn't work out that way. I think mm. it's going to be around what what turned out in uh, 2016. 2016, but one of the one of the factors may have been that there's people were undecided. You know, and when you're undecided, you're not as motivated to go out mm. because they felt that there were a lot of good candidates there, and and in fact, in all the interviews I did, everybody to a person said, "Whoever wins, I'm going to support. We have to get this guy out of the White House." Well, that's important, but don't you think it? Uh, it's important that a uh, socialist. <laughs> Democratic kind of guy like Bernie Sanders and a gay candidate with the two top vote getters in Iowa. I mean, oh, yeah. that's kind of big, man, don't you that think? Is. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. And then and Elizabeth Warren came in second, and you put all of that together. That's a very progressive and democratic majority in terms of the Iowa voters, uh, which bodes well for the future. You know, I've always said that. Uh, it's going to take a movement, a mass electoral movement, to defeat Trump. So, in that context, what to make of uh, what to make of Michael Bloomberg, who's decided to skip the first four primaries, join in on the the big states? Well, there's no movement around uh, a Bloomberg. There's just a half a uh, a billion dollars, and the question is, and, and though I do think it's going to be really important to have the center of the Democratic Party and the independents as part of the anti-Trump coalition. The big question is, uh, you know, will there be excitement and motivation around, around uh, you know, the uh, different candidates? And I'm not sure. Now, y'all can contradict me if you want. It's a free country and a free wheeling program. Um, well, not that quite. Will I get invited back, though? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm, I, I just don't see what Bloomberg brings to the table that um, a guy uh, like um, Beto or O'Rourke or, or, or Cory Booker or uh, huh, didn't bring, you know what I mean? Or um, the Kamala sister, Harris or Kamala Harris. What does he bring that they didn't have. I'm just not getting it. You know what I mean? I just... The interesting thing for me was um, sort of, you can tell the, the extent to which the working class and uh, is becoming the, the center of political gravity in this election by w how Bloomberg is sort of adjusting his tech. He published in, um, an op-ed in the New York Times yesterday, I believe, uh, calling for... Um, taxing the rich, uh, actually uh, some, some really progressive tax reforms, um, uh, ending the loophole that allows um, money managers to <clears throat> tax capital gains or tax income, their income as capital gains, uh, a wealth tax, a whole bunch of, like he basically wrote a, a, an op-ed saying we need to tax the rich. Um, good, good. Well, that's good. That's a, that's a yeah, no, it's, and it shows, again, this is not about an individual and their vision. It's about the movement and the balance of forces within it, and we can see the the dynamism and the, the growing strength of. Uh, of yeah, the yeah, I'm I'm going to be, I guess, a little contrary. Um, Go ahead, because I think that um, you know the the it is the movements. You're right; it is the movements that are in, are influencing um, the the candidates and the campaigns, and both uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, I think, are riding. And those, you know, um, 
however, the reality is, is that uh, I think once the uh, primaries move into other states, particularly states that are much more racially diverse, uh, there's going to be a whole new dynamic uh, unfold in, in the uh, primary. One of the big factors you have to take into account is Bloomberg. I think, um, you know, he's pouring a enormous amounts of money um, into these uh, Super Tuesday states. He's already spent a, a half a billion dollars in advertising um, in many of those states and other states. He has, he's hiring thousands of, of staff people. They're, they're on the ground. They're doing, they, they, have, they, have, they have an infrastructure, campaign infrastructure, which has to be, you know, taken into account. Um, and they're pouring, he's doubling down now and they're pouring so much money into advertising that they're actually crowding out some of the other candidates. So Ooh. I think that this is, this is gonna be a factor that uh, all these candidates are gonna have to deal with. And I think particularly Biden, I think Biden in Iowa, Biden probably was damaged more than anything there. And so well, his Trump campaign and, uh, really is They tried to take him out during, during the, uh, during the uh, uh, trial in the Senate. I mean, it was all directed at, at Biden. You know, they were playing right. asymmetrical political warfare. And right. it, it was directly aimed at, uh, at uh, Biden, you know. So it's going to be a rough and tumble uh, primary season. And then once the uh, Republican and Democratic Party conventions take place, the general election is going to be, it's going to be a hot and heavy process. And so we need to keep our eye on the prize, which is defeating Trump and the GOP, breaking their back in the Senate and in the House and electing a, a new uh, Democratic president. We got to stop the fascist danger. By the way, we got a question of the week, uh, Scott, about uh, uh, the presidential campaign and they want to know when we're going to run a communist what was the question yeah, uh, so a, a reader named Blake uh, wrote in um, asking um, is CPUSA going to nominate a presidential candidate uh, this time around because he thinks um, uh, there's a lot of support for the kind of democratic program that we have um, and it could really um, help bring people together around uh, a vision of equality um, it's a good question. It's a good question. And the answer is no. We're not running a presidential candidate uh, uh, this year, nor are we running candidates for the uh, Senate, or I don't think even the House of Representatives, maybe one place in the House. I'm not sure about that. But at the local level, we do encourage uh, candidacies and so on. But I think that the main issue is, again, to keep our eye on the prize. And once you get into the era of uh, area of presidential politics, you got to be really careful so that you don't run in such a way that you contribute to the, the right wing. Now, John, uh, you sent me an email the other day with an open letter to the Greens signed by several uh, progressive uh, people, including Leslie Kagan and Ron Daniels. Ron is from my hometown, by the way. And when I was coming up, I always voted for him, even when he wasn't running. <laughs> he, uh, that's, that's my guy. Anyway, so uh, Bill Fletcher and um, a number of others, uh, the woman from uh, the Democratic Socialist, what's her name, John? Um, uh, so anyway, so what were they saying, John, about the green uh, strategy in the election? What was the sense of that open letter? Well, just basically along the lines of what we've been talking about is that, you know, we're, we're dealing with a, a fascist threat uh, to democracy and we have to have maximum unity and we, we're dealing with a two party system. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, it's going to be one or the other. It's going to be either Trump or a Democrat elected. And in particular, in, uh, we're, we're talking about this election really boiling down to a handful of key states, um, maybe six or seven states. Um, and if the Green Party does run in those states in particular, you know, you're talking about them taking away a few thousand uh, votes, which could swing the election. 
Uh, and in fact, that if you look at what happened in Wisconsin, and I think Michigan, Michigan. you know, the last election, uh, the difference between Clinton and Trump was actually the Green Party vote. Now, it's debatable as to whether or not uh, if they hadn't been on the ballot, people would have voted for, uh, you know, Clinton, but we don't know that. But the main thing is, is that to have a third party like the Greens is going to split the vote. And we saw something like that uh, when um, the consumer guy, what's his name, who, who ran? Oh, uh, Ralph Nader, yeah, Ralph back, Nader back in ran, 2000. Right? Yeah. yeah, you know, and, against Gore. And But we have to be careful, I think. You know, the, the, the Green Party's strategy certainly played a role in getting Trump elected. Um, but in, uh, certainly in Wisconsin uh, and in many other states, um, voter suppression was a much much greater one. Talk about a difference, not of a couple thousand votes, but of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of votes. So um, when it, as we talk about things that um, destroy the unity and, and break the power of this democratic movement, uh, I think we have to keep voter suppression kind of uh, front and center. Uh, That's a good entree into the next point I want to make, uh, Scott and John, and th this is Black History Month. And so we want to uh, wish everyone a happy Black History Month and encourage you to go to the, watch the different programs or go to the different celebrations in your city. And also to check out uh, our website at cpusa.org. We're going to have, and our Facebook page, we're going to have a, a series of articles and memes and photos. We just published uh, one last week of Shirley Graham Du Bois, who was a leading African-American playwright and biographer, uh, a journalist, uh, a member of the Communist Party for most of her life, um, and, uh, and many others. Uh, so uh, please uh, check us out at cpusa.org. And we have a discussion question this month, Scott, what is the uh, sense of that dealing yeah, with the, the discussion quality? question is um, it sort of highlights uh, that you know the Communist Party has always held that the struggle against racism is absolutely central to the struggle for socialism and the struggle for democracy in this country. Um, and so we ask, how can our party most effectively contribute to building unity? within the working class across racial lines, but also unity between the whole working class and uh, the movements of racially and nationally oppressed people, specifically African Americans. How can we build, how can we unite the whole working class with the African American people and their struggle for equality? So you can write at discussion at cpusa.org and send in your comments, or you can comment here on Facebook, or or you can go to the website, cpusa.org, and uh, click on the slider at the top, and you'll find all of the rules and links and places to make a contribution. Well, and I think don't that just about come. does it for us. I'm sorry, Scott. So uh, if you haven't yet registered for our um, online class on February 23rd, we're having a book talk led by Dr. Michael Honey, the author of To the Promised Land, uh, Martin Luther King's struggle for economic justice. Uh, I think it's going to be great. Um, you can find registration info either on the, the discussion question page, on our Facebook page. Um, so do register and, and uh, attempt to attend. I think it's going to be wonderful. So before we go, I want to thank John for your reporting on the Iowa caucuses. You and Al Neal did a great job. You can read that at peoplesworld.org. And John, I got a note today from a comrade in Philadelphia who reminded me that today is the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Young Workers Liberation League. So uh, happy 50th birthday uh, to the YWLL and all of the activists and young revolutionaries who ain't so young anymore uh, who helped found the uh, YWLL uh, we want to uh, say that uh, we celebrate your contribution. Um, and uh, without what you did, we wouldn't be literally sitting here today talking to you. Isn't that true, John? Oh, absolutely. 
you know, the Young Workers Liberation League was had a tremendous history and made a really powerful contribution, you know, to many struggles during that era and I trained a whole generation really of, of Marxist, young Marxists, you know, so we have so much to be thankful for, including uh, us. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And this year, we're also celebrating the 100th birthday of the uh, Communist Party uh, USA. Stay tuned. Next week, we'll be back. Um, uh, same time, same station <laughs> here on Facebook and on YouTube. And uh, have a good one. So that's it. Uh, I think that we're done. Take care. Have a yeah. good week. Bye-bye.